We are the paradoxical ape. Bipedal, naked, large-brained. Long the master of fire, tools, and language, but still trying to understand ourselves. Aware that death is inevitable, yet filled with optimism. We grow up slowly. We hand down knowledge. We empathize and deceive. We shape the future from our shared understanding of the past. Carta brings together experts from diverse disciplines to exchange insights on who we are and how we got here. An exploration made possible by the generosity of humans like you. Dr. Boyd came to us uh, all the way from New Zealand to be here uh, today. Uh, and we really, as we were thinking about the symposium, we could think of nobody better, really, than to lead off the symposium. He's thought and written extensively about storytelling in the context of philosophy, art, literature, even comics. In fact, this morning he sent around a, a little paper of his that I hadn't seen in which he really seems to capture the entire animal-human relationship by, organize, by examining one uh, uh, comic strip. Uh, so he's going to begin by helping ground our discussion of what a story is and why humans tell stories. So let's welcome Dr. Boyd. Well, thanks to uh, Danny, uh, Brandon, and Polly, and to Carter for organizing what should be an amazing symposium. It's, a, it's an honor to be here. I'm an English professor, and I get by in this profession, but there's much I don't like about it. One of the things I dislike most is that our field tends to focus on stories, yet virtually no one in English or anywhere in literary studies asks why we are a, sto a story storytelling species, or what difference that makes to us, or how we understand stories so well. That means ignoring the kinds of stories that aren't in English, the kinds of stories that aren't written, like most stories even now, let alone in the bulk of human prehistory and history, the kinds that aren't literary, like jokes, or gossip, or history, or, or myths, or religious stories and the kinds that aren't adult, like the stories that children first hear or see or make up. Literary studies often focus far too narrowly. They pay too little attention to the range, variety and context, and even the impact of stories, and to what's been discovered outside English or outside literature, in science and in the, the psychological and social sciences. So why do we tell stories? Minds, not just human minds, and control systems even in creatures without minds, like plants, evolved in order to make organisms better, predict better predictors of their immediate surroundings, of risks and rewards, obstacles and opportunities around them. In the case of higher animals, to understand settings and situations, and especially agents or events. By agents, I mean anything that can act, a lunging croc, but not a falling rock. Especially agents and events because they make the most volatile and relevant difference. Minds work by pattern recognition. They can handle information in real time only by seeing it in terms of patterns and patterns of patterns. The more flexible the species' behaviour and the more flexible its interaction with other species, the more important it is to know the patterns in settings, environments, weather, kinds, animals and plants, situations, events and characters. 
Humans especially need to learn the patterns of different kinds of situations and consequences. The more precise, the better, and the patterns of different personalities. Individuals learn by themselves, by acting and provoking reactions, and by doing and by assessing the success of what they've done. And in social species, they also learn by watching one another. In all species that can communicate well, individuals can also learn what lies beyond what they can sense for themselves. Yet species other than ours seem limited to communicating about the here and now. Humans are not eusocial like bees, ants, and naked mole rats. But unlike other species, we are ultra-social, as we be began to be when our forebears developed cooperative breeding, cooperative hunting and gathering, cooperative fire making, and habits of joint attention. And we're ultra-flexible. And unlike other species, we depend for our special success not on some kind of physical advantage, but on our social advantages, our sharing and command of information, our cognitive niche. For those reasons, because we are so social, so flexible, and so reliant on information, because human survival came to depend less on individual behavior and more on collective cooperation, we invented language as a way of communicating what's beyond our own immediate perception and beyond the here and now, as a way of instructing our imaginations in the terms proposed by the linguist Daniel Dore. As Dore writes, first we invented language, then language changed us. And not least because there's a positive feedback loop connecting our ultra-sociality and our ultra-flexibility and language. We almost certainly invented language out of mimetic proto-language, pointing, gestures, miming, facial expression, and vocal sound. A great leap forward from earlier primate arm waving and vocal cries, but at the same time likely to have been rife with repetitions and ambiguities and approximations and obscurities. Through language, we gradually learned to instruct the imaginations of others in precise ways beyond the here and now. What happened yesterday or last year, or to Jack but not to Jill, or what might happen tomorrow or next season. Because language made such a difference, we invented new ways of extending it, new words and meanings, new syntax such as new tenses, and new ways of reducing error, misconstructions, misarticulations. And as we invented, we also evolved capacities for rapider and richer production and comprehension of language. This meant that we could learn more and more about individual others and about human nature through language, through narrative, as well as through our individual observation. As the primatologist Franz de Waal shows, direct individual observation of others' behavior already reaches complex levels in chimpanzees and bonobos, but we humans can go well beyond that. We're eager to acquire and share knowledge, especially social knowledge, as the most volatile and therefore the most likely not to be already known by others, and the most relevant and likely to be valued. We are eager for gossip, both as listeners and as gossipers who have valuable social knowledge to impart. Not that sometimes we're not also strategically eager to conceal information. Through true stories, we can learn more about particular individuals we might interact with and social positions, and about unusual situations and events and personalities. And this better knowledge of other individuals and of the range of behaviors and characters, desires and intentions, predicaments and solutions, and norms and transgressions, helps us know what better what it can be to be human, what risks we may face, what options we, we may have so that we can cooperate and compete better through understanding one another more fully as individuals, in societies, and as a species. And just as we invented language and then language changed us, so we invented narrative and narrative changed us. We invented ways and we evolved them 
to tell and follow stories better, including the capacity to in, imply in and to infer from stories particular and general significance, and the capacity to understand causes and consequences in situational, social, and psychological terms. Although we can learn so much about the range of human character and action from true stories, we can, what we can learn that way is restricted to what others happen to have observed and happen to communicate according to their sense of listener's interest. Of course, we learn not just by observing, but even more by doing, by trial and error. And we learn especially by play, by pushing species typical behavior to extremes so that we can master even them, so that in situations of urgency, we can react more expertly and appropriately. By exuberantly exaggerating actions and reactions like chasing or cavorting, tilting themselves off balance and recuperating, creatures learn in times of low stress to increase their facility and range of operations needed in their species in times of high stress or urgency. That has such advantages that in species after species, in fact, in every species where it's been looked for, from octopi to orangutans, evolution has made play compulsive, irresistible, inviting, engaging, fun. In the human case, as children, we engage not only in physical play, but from early on in pretend play, including soon through social play, through role play. And through social play, and play fighting, cops and robbers, for instance, or team sports, we learn about cooperation and competition, dominance and sharing, resilience and persistence. But we also learn not just by action and observation and play. We learn still faster about human possibilities and predicaments through language, through true stories, and through fiction, through narrative as play through invented stories, untrue stories, not designed to deceive, but to be enjoyed. In fiction, as in play, events can be exuberantly exaggerated, larger than life, thrown off balance, and yet often recover a new kind of balance. Exuberant as in hero or superhero stories or action films, or exaggerated in characters, or in changes of fortune, from heights to depths in tragedy, from impossible complications to satisfying resolutions in comedy, from horrific obstacles to triumph. Fictional stories can be specifically designed to attract and hold attention and to impart the rewards of imaginative stimulation and emotional engagement and discovery. And learning correlates with attention and engagement. Like other forms of play, fictions have evolved to be compulsive and emotionally self-rewarding for humans. First, because they give us the pleasure of engagement with others, even if with unreal others. The default response of enjoying social engagement is there. We're, we're often in some sense allied with some, perhaps many, of the participants in a story. Second, because fictions expand and populate our imaginations so that we can imagine for hours in a focused way offline. We can understand one another better, sorry, um, off, offline, away from the here and now, in a, man, in a manner that we find very difficult in other domains. And third, because we learn so much from stories, with this expanded sense of the range of human possibilities and predicaments and personalities, we can understand one another better and more quickly which helps with both cooperation and competition. Fictions reward the best storytellers with prestige, a human form of social status aside from physical or social dominance. As is confirmed in a recent study in the Agta, a foraging people in the Philippines, where people prefer as associates in the small groups that they form, the best storytellers even over the best foragers. Stories are both naturally and culturally selected to be about what matters for a particular way of life, a particular society. Like the Australian Aboriginal topological myths 
that explain and imprint particular features of the local landscape in the minds of its inhabitants. Stories in general are also more often pro-social than anti-social, and if they're focused on the anti-social, they tend to show the costs more vividly than the re rewards. They can embody and enact and articulate and impart local values. And especially in small-scale societies with a small repertoire of common fictions, they solve what economists call the, pro the problem of common knowledge. I'll do something only if you will, and vice versa. But how do I know you will? And how do I know that you know that I will? By making us feel that we share these values and react in much the same way. Through language and through story, we not only learn about the world, we also learn what others see and understand and what they don't see and don't understand. And therefore, what and how much we sometimes might be at risk of not seeing and not understanding. We realize in a newly vivid and uniquely human way what we might not know, what we can't explain. And because we know it's possible to make deadly mistakes by not knowing the real situation, we try to cover or leap over those gaps in our knowledge. We confabulate. Our minds generate stories to bridge gaps, even without our realizing it. We overextend agency. It's safer to suppose a bush is a bear than the other way around. And because we know events can happen through unseen causes like desires and intentions. And because we are fascinated by agents with exceptional powers, exceptional humans or animals that can do what we can't, it's very easy for human minds that have developed imagination through language and through stories, true ones as well as false ones, to suppose unseen agents with powers beyond the human behind unexplained events and therefore to concoct spirits and gods that coalesce into religious stories. Humans tend to believe religious stories because they cover gaps of information we don't like to have to face. They provide a, a reassurance, apparently deeper knowledge behind the scenes explanations to answer our why questions. And because they tend to embody norms that help us act together that help bind communities. And communities that cohere better are likely to outcompete other communities that cohere less well. Stories need not be true to be of benefit. If they're memorable and engage the emotions and inspire confidence and motivate beneficial behavior, they'll thrive and help us thrive. And that's especially true up to a point of relig religious stories. And that's usually up to the point where they clash with other people's religious stories. Stories need not be true to be of benefit. On the other hand, true information can be much more beneficial than false. If we want to change outcomes, it's useful to know what the true causes of the unfavorable outcomes so far have been as in the case of SpaceX's rapid, unscheduled disassembly of their rocket. This is why science, which aims unsparingly at truth, is not just another story. Science doesn't pander to our overreading of agency that makes stories and religion so natural to us. Fictions, including the fictions of religion, do not invite challenge. They close themselves off. Of course, if stories become classic enough, they'll be retold. Milton reworked Genesis into Paradise Lost, Joyce reworked Homer, Homer's Odyssey into Ulysses, or to tumble from the sublime to the ridiculous, the, the zombie Pride and Prejudice, or the Valley Girl version of Austin's Emma in the movie Clueless. Science overthrows old stories, old explanations, in an attempt to get closer to the truth not to tickle taste buds or even to modernize implications and values. 
Unlike fiction, science can be challenged all the way by anybody. There's no end to the story of science. And that, of course, will be true of my attempt to bring a little science to bear on the question of why we tell stories. Thank you.